Hello, everybody. We're at Pesachim Dafnun Hey. Uh, four basic topics. First, about being presumptuous or haughty uh, in, in doing a practice that most people aren't doing. And uh, so there's uh, rules and regulations about who's for whom is it, is it appropriate to not work uh, on Tisha B'Av when everyone else is working. We're going to compare that to saying Shema on one's wedding night. Uh, the next topic will be more about working on Erev, Shab- Erev Pesach and the night before uh, when we do B'dikat Chametz. There's also a law according to Bet Shemai not to do work then. We'll see according to Rebbe Meir, this is a custom, and according to Rebbe Uda, it's actually a halacha, it's a law. And then uh, cease uh, limits on permitted activity on Erev Shabbat. In other words, even in places where they do activity on Erev Pesach, sorry, Pesach, uh, in the morning, uh, nevertheless, you can't begin a new project, only finish something that you already started before. And we're going to wonder, does that also apply if some if it's something you need for the holiday itself? And we'll, we'll prove that um, that would still be prohibited. And we'll talk about three craftsmen that can begin projects, according to Chachamim. And then we're going to um, compare Erev Pesach, the prohibition against doing work then in the morning, to Cholam Oed which is also this in-between. All of these topics of, uh, of not doing melacha are very interesting because they're not the 39 melachot that are typically prohibited on Shabbat and Yom Tov, except for cooking, but it's a different conceptualization of not working. It's um, uh, not doing field work and regular money-making work, but uh, things that you need for that time are permitted and yet there are still differences between Erev Pesach and Chol Moed. For example, uh, putting the chicken on the egg, sweeping the barn and delivering to and from the craftsmen. All right, we begin with haughtiness. In our Mishnah, it said that uh, some people have a, have a custom to work on so, Tisha um, some people don't have a custom to work. And Chachamim say, sages should not work, right? They are they are more, are more pious, and they should not refrain from work on Tisha B'Av to concentrate on uh, feeling the morning. And Ashbag adds that everyone may act like a sage on that day. In other words, appropriate even for common people to not work. So you see that according to Ashbag, he doesn't worry about Yohara. He doesn't consider that it's going to be, uh, if you're a common person, that you're making yourself like uh, a presumptuous, that people are going to say, oh, well, who is he to not work? It's okay. Everyone can do that. So he doesn't worry about haughtiness. And the Banan say, we do worry about uh, looking like you are haughty, being too presumptuous. You're not in that category that you're so pious all year round that you can do this. So that's what it seems from this context. However, but in the Mishnah and Berachot, it looks like it's the opposite way around in the, of these two opinions. Ditnan, Hatan, im yisel likrot kirehat shema la'ila rishon kore. Laban Shimon ben Gamliel amar, lo kol harose litol atashem yitol. Everyone has a mitzvah to say kirehat shema every night. However, a Hatan, someone who just got married, and this is his wedding night, he's going to consecrate. Uh, his wedding. So he's, con- he's concentrating on the first time he's going to be with his wife, which is also a mitzvah. So how sick a mitzvah, patur mena mitzvah. So therefore, a chatan, um, Rashbag in this case says, uh, if, if you want to say Shema, you should not. Only someone who is on a high level, very pious, and he always has special concentration, and he can concentrate even on that night, he may say it, but a regular person cannot say God's name and say Shema when we know he's not going to concentrate well on it. Uh, Chachamim, in that case, however, say that if, if, if you want to say it, it's fine, even if you're a common person, and I, maybe you won't have a uh, great kavana, but it's okay, you can say it. So you see that in this case, it's the Chachamim that don't worry about Yohara, you can be presumptuous, presumptuous and Rashbag is the one that says, uh, you may not, and that's the opposite of what they say here uh, regarding working. Uh, so we're going to have two answers to this question. Rabbi Yochanan says, change the opinions around. We got, we transmitted it wrong. 
Uh, it doesn't say which one we change around. Um, I guess the Berachot one you could change around. And so really uh, it's uh, Rashbag that says, you can say it and even if you're a common person and the Chachamim say the opposite. And that, what, that's way, that way they are consistent. Okay, that's a simple way to, uh, to uh, solve the problem. Uh, if, you know, does Rabbi Yochanan have, actually have a tradition that, that the, that the um, uh, positions are switched or is you just assuming that we must be the answer? This is interesting because this Mukhlefet Hashita occurs over a dozen times throughout the Talmud Bavli and almost always in the name of Rabbi Yochanan. So which makes you wonder, did Rabbi Yochanan actually say this each and every time he's quoted? Or maybe he said it once or twice and it's the, the later uh, his students or, or editors of the Bavli that are applying his uh, methodology to other cases where they deem it appropriate. Okay, uh, I, we can, I can't answer that, but in any case, that's the best of Yochanan solution. Um, just switch it around, and that way they'll be, uh, they'll line up. However, Rav Shisha, Bered, Rav Idi Amad, Latipuch, no, no, leave them as they are, and we can still reconcile them logically. How so? The Rabbanan, Ad Rabbanan, Lakashya. The rabbis in each case, uh, the first one where they say um, everyone should refrain from working, Antisha Ba'av, and yet they say, uh, a commoner should not say Shema on his wedding night. Uh, Regarding Tisha B'Av, everyone is busy working. They're all going to, going to their offices and going to their fields and their shops. And you're just sitting around. There, it's a public spectacle. And everyone's going to look at you. Oh, you think you're so special on Tisha B'Av that you are, are sitting in, on the floor in mourning and everybody else is working? So that's not appropriate. However, regarding saying Kirat Shema, let's say he's in Bed Knesset that, that night, and he's saying Shema, and everyone else is saying Shema. He's doing the same as everybody else, and therefore he's not standing out. So even though it's his wedding night, it's okay. Um, so the difference here for him is, are you doing something different from everyone else or the same as everyone else? If it's the same as everyone else, even if, in your particular situation, you don't have to do that. That's not going to stand out and will not be Yohada. And we can resolve it for Rashbag also. We can reconcile his two opinions. Regarding saying Kirat Shema, you need to have proper intention. You shouldn't just recite it and uh, you know saying random words. Um, and we know that most people are not going to be able to concentrate on Kirat Shema during their wedding night. And therefore, that is inappropriate, presumptuous for a regular person, unless you're really pious and someone can then, and have concentration. However, if someone is not working on Tisha B'Av, even though they're not a Talmid Chacham, it's okay because people looking at him won't assume that he's not working because it's Tisha B'Av and he wants to be extra pious, um, they, they can say maybe he just has nothing to do. There's a lot of people sitting around uh, um, not, not working uh, in the shuk. They're just walking around, sitting and relaxing. And so it won't look like uh, it's, um, it's a, 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 he's doing anything different. So over here for Rashbag, the difference is being passive and uh, being active. Um, okay, so we were able to resolve it both ways. Um, regarding saying Kiryat Shema on one's wedding night uh, is that we, we all do say it. Uh, the reason is kind of the opposite. Uh, the rabbis later say, you know what, most people don't have such great kavana all year round for their whole lives. So it's not like this, this uh, night they're going to have any particular less kavana than usual. And therefore, in other words, we're on such a low level, we're like less than commoners of those days. Um, all right, hope that hopefully this will be an inspiration to try to have more kavana when we say Kiryat Shema. And also, don't look like you're presumptuous um, and, and try to lo look like you're more pious than your fellow person. Uh, so two good lessons from that sugya. Next Mishnah. So now we're going back all the way back to the first Mishnah that opened this pedic, um, and we note that 
in the Chachamim now note that in Judea, in the south of uh, Israel, they would, the practice was to do work on Edif Pesach from sunrise until midday. However, in the Galilee, in the north, they would not do any work uh, during the day, in other words, the whole day from morning to night. And now what about the night before? We haven't even discussed that yet. Halayla, that's the night of the 14th when we do Bedikat Chametz. Bet Shammai Osrim, so according to Bet Shammai, First, look at the language, asur, not only like you know, a, a minhag, he says an absolute prohibition to do work from the, the, the entire night and day of the 14th. Uh, Bet Hillel matirin ad hanesachama. Bet Hillel says, no, it's totally permitted to do anything you need to do, uh, anything you want at night until sunrise. And from sunrise on, that's when it depends on where you are. Good, that is the Mishnah. Now we note a contradiction. Back in the first Mishnah, it said, So that implied it all depends on custom. All right, this is not an official halacha. This is just a customary thing to do. And yet here in our Mishnah, look at the end, we Bet Shammai Osrim is talking about, uh, it's talking about prohibited and permitted. Uh, the clause over here about Yehuda and, and Galil oh, is not quite clear, it kind of falls in the middle. Uh, I think the ori original understanding is uh, that this is part of Minhag, but we're going to see as the uh, 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 discussion ensues that the, uh, the Gemara is going to understand that this clause also is considered Isur Veheter, not just Minhag, but actual prohibition in Judea. Okay, it doesn't say that word, but that's what it's going to assume. Um, okay. So that's the question. Which one is it? Is it a custom or an absolute uh, law? Uh, Rabbi Meir is the one that said it's, a, it's only a custom not to work in those places where they don't work. It's only customary. And Rabbi Huda says it is actually a prohibition in those places where they don't do it. Um, it's uh, absolute prohibited. Okay, so usually when you have a, a discrepancy between each place, uh, there's more variation regarding custom, but here we see there could be some variation even regarding laws. Tanya, how do we know that's the difference between these two Tanaim? Baraita says, Good. Rebihuda, so Rebihuda is the exact words of Chachamim here, right? So um, uh, probably the Baraita, this Baraita was an earlier source, and Rebihuda Nasi wanted this to be the Lacha, so transmitted it as. Chachamim. Okay, good. But in the original source, we have another opinion. So the Rabbi Meir tells the Rabbi Yehuda, oh, this is why are you bringing a proof? What kind of proof are you bringing from Yehuda and Galil? As if it's, this is a law. Right? It doesn't depend on, it doesn't depend on any law. It depends on custom. And so wherever you are, you follow the local custom. And then he goes and repeats the same words that we have in our Mishnah all the way back in Mishnah 1. So you see in this Beraita, there was a conversation and, and um, this is probably the older source. In our Mishnah, Rabbi Yudah Nasi takes Rabbi Yudah and makes that Mishnah number one and takes it Rabbi, uh, anonymous and takes Rabbi Yudah and makes it this Mishnah in the name of Chachamim. So now that we have this original source, we can answer the original question. Since Rabbi Meir explicitly says the word minhag, so we can infer that his, his disagreement with, with Rabbi Yehuda is that Rabbi Yehuda considers it asur and heter. And that would flow straight into the Bet Shammai who says osrim. All right, good. So that's how we answer, re resolve the question. It's just still as interesting because the Mishnah does not give any names. And so we need this back uh, background material to know uh, that there are actually different opinions. Uh, question, is this true that according to the Biuda in Judea, he said in Judea, uh, you're allowed to work in the, in the morning. Does he really think that? Okay, so the case here is that in, uh, Rabbi Uda looks like he, he would, he's saying here that you are allowed. 
that you're not allowed to work in Judea. How, how so? Based on this case, if someone is taking the weeds out of his field on the 13th, and we're wondering, we're going to wonder, why does he say the 13th, uh, not the 14th? Um, anyway, while he's taking the weeds out, he takes out a plant, a good plant of grain, and so uh, he wants to replant it. That's fine. He should, but he should replant it not in a dry place in the earth, but rather in a moist, in moist earth. Why? What's the difference? Okay. So the 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 reason is because um, the uh, so the Ahmed is about to begin right on the sixteenth. That's when we bring the barley offering, and once you bring the barley offering, the Ahmed. Uh, you begin Sifirat Ahmed, that's when any grain that took root before the 16th, you're allowed to eat immediately during that year. That's called Yashan. Any grain that did not yet take root on the 16th is going to be uh, called Chadash until a full year later. So this guy, when he's pulling weeds out on the 13th, and all of a sudden he pulled out some grain, he's like, oh no, this is not good. Because now if he plants it in some dry uh, uh, earth, it's not going to take root again. And now he's not going to, he won't be able to eat from this whenever it gets ripe until a full year later. So put it in moist earth so that it will uh, take root in the, within the next couple of days. And that way it'll be okay. Good. That was a halacha. We're still gonna. We're still proving the point. Now, bishlosha sarin. So on the thirteenth, yes, that's what he should do because he can replant it on the thirteenth. Bar la. Since he said the thirteenth, it sounds like the Buddha would say, on, if it was the fourteenth, you're not allowed to replant it because you can't do work on the fourteenth. Oh, so there you go. You see, he says, what is this in? Uh, assuming it's in Judea right now. Um, so it's in Judea, and that he cannot do work on the 14th. Um, to, to fill out the argument, any, any, any graft that does not take hold within three days will not uh, take hold at all. Uh, so you need three days for something to take root also. So therefore, it would be perfectly fine for if he thought that work is permitted on the 14th, and he said in Judea it's permitted on the 14th, if so, then he could have given a case on the 14th, because you have three days, right? The 14th, Haika Arbesar, Bachamesar is the second day, Umiksat Shittesar, and even the partial day. In Halakha, a partial day is considered a whole day. So if, even if it's the 14th in the morning, and so he has another few hours of the 14th, the whole day of 15th, a few hours of the 16th until they actually bring the Omer, and that would be three days, and that would be sufficient for it to take root. And so um, therefore, Rabbi Uda could have, you said, an example of a case on the 14th. The fact that he doesn't must mean that he thinks the 14th is prohibited uh, from doing work, even in Judea. So that's the contradiction. Okay, the answer is not so difficult. No, maybe this halacha that he was saying is talking about in the Galilee. In the Galilee, the widespread practice is not to do any work. But you're right, if he was in Judea, then he could even do that on the 14th. That's one answer. Um, question on that answer. Why doesn't he say the 14th, even in the Galilee, because he could do it the night before, right? The night, Bidikat Chametz, Betilel says you can do work. So he could still give an example on the 14th. Marav Sheshat, Kibet Shamai. Oh, he's following Bet Shamai. That's not really a good answer. So we're not going to stick to that too for too long. No one goes and pulls weeds at night. You can't see what you're doing. You're going to be pulling out random things. So you don't have to worry about the, the nighttime. Uh, rather, we're talking about the daytime and it's talking about the Galilee. And that's why in the Galilee, they did not do, he's not going to pull the weeds at night on the 14th. Because uh, it's nighttime. He, it's in the galley, so they don't do any work on the 14th in the morning. And that's why he said the 13th. Okay, so that all makes sense. Ravina has yet another answer. Ravina amar leolam bihuda ubahash rasha had miksat hayom kekulo amrinan. Tere miksat hayom kekulo la amrinan. It could be in Judea. Um, and the, the thing is that when, when we say you need three days for something that you just planted in moist earth to take root, it needs at least two and a half days 
not one day and two half days, right? So al halakha in general, we do say miksat hayom kikulo. Uh, the, the most, uh, the place where we use this the most is if someone is in mourning, all right? So the day of burial, even if they bury the, 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 the body an hour before sunset and they tear their clothing, that day is considered one, even if they're only sitting for a few minutes. And then the last day, they get up right in the morning. So on both ends, you say miksat hayom kikulo, well, really, they're only uh, most people only sit five days and two partial days at the beginning and the end. That's fine for things like mourning. But regarding here, what's actually a natural process, we need it to 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 grow and take root. So it needs two full days, and then you could have a partial day. Therefore, that's why he didn't even in Judea, where they can work on the fourteenth in the morning, it's still only going to be a partial day. So that's why he said the thirteenth, and now that way we can reconcile. Uh, and Rabbi Uda's both two opinions. Okay, good. Um, so that, that was about working on it of Shabbat. And now we're going to talk about limits on permitted, permitted activity on Ed of Shabbat. And according to the Bimeid, and it may not begin a new project. Um, we're going to wonder about that. Okay, so he said you can't begin a new project. It sounds like even in places where you're allowed to do work on Ed of Pesach, you still can't begin a new project, only finish something that you started already. We're going to ask about him. What if you need that thing for the holiday? Whatever you're, you need, some you're making some clothing that you're going to need for the holiday. Um, is that allowed or not? Uh, we're going to have two attempts to say it's pro prohibited, um, but they they reject those proofs. In the end, we're going to prove that it is in fact prohibited, uh, even if you need it for the holiday. So we're going to end up with a strict interpretation of the bimeir. All right, let's see the mishnah. The bimeir omer kol melacha sheitchil ba. Anything that you started doing before the 14th, you're allowed to finish it on the 14th in the morning. But don't start something new on the 14th in the morning, even if you if it's just, uh, something that takes just five minutes and you can finish it in the mornings, nevertheless, you're not allowed. That's a bimeir. Hachamim omerim shalosh umaniyot osin melacha ve'arve pesachim ad chasot. Sages look like they're being more lenient than a bimeir and say regarding these three craftsmen, they're allowed to do whatever they want uh, until noon. It's always until noon. After noon, everyone agrees you can't do work because that's when you should be preparing korban pesach. So the tailors and the barbers and the launderers, right? They got to prepare everybody for the for the holiday so you can begin a haircut and finish a haircut. You can begin a batch of laundry and finish it. That's okay. Also shoemakers, uh, you know, people are coming... Uh, uh, traveling to their uh, to their in-laws, they're traveling to Yerushalayim, and their shoes might wear out, so they got to get their shoes ready. Okay, so that's the uh, two opinions in the Mishnah, and now the Gemara will present three possible interpretations of the Bimeir. Ibat Yalehu, the Sorech HaMoed Tenan, Aval Shelo the Sorech HaMoed, Afilu Migmar Nami La. When the Bimeir says you can uh, finish something, uh, a project on the 14th in the morning, is that only for something you need for the holiday? But if it's not for the holiday, you can't even finish it, right? If you're uh, finishing your taxes and you don't need that until after the holiday and you started already, it doesn't matter. You can't do that on the 14th in the morning. So this is the most stringent possibility. All it has to be something you started already and you need it for the holiday. Or maybe the Mishnah is talking about something you don't need for the holiday. That In that case, you can't begin it anew, but you can finish it. But if it's something you need for the holiday, then you can even begin the project on the 14th. This is the most lenient opinion. Or maybe it doesn't matter whether you need it for the holiday or not, don't need it for the holiday, you can finish something, but you can't start it. Okay, the third one sounds like the simplest because Bimeir didn't say anything about do you need it for the holiday or not. So the third possibility is just in the middle, uh, it's not even a consideration what, wh whether you need it or not. All right, attempted proof number one that for the most stringent um, uh, uh, opinion. Tashima, 
אבל לא יתחיל בתחילה ב-14, אפילו סלסול קטן, אפילו סבחה קטנה. You should not start uh, making something on the 14th, and even a small belt or a small hairnet, something that takes only a few minutes to make, you should not do that. Presumably, these are things that you're going to use on the holiday. You need a belt to wear or a hairnet to wear on the holiday. So my afilo, why is it? What do you mean afilo, even these things? Lav afilo hane de la sorach ha-moed. You need these for the holidays, and yet, migmar in, atchule la, you can finish them, but you cannot begin doing them on the holiday. And we can infer from this that if you don't need it, then you cannot even finish something that you began. So this, uh, uh, this statement seems like it proves the first interpretation. Uh, we say not necessarily. No, maybe not. Maybe even if you don't need it, you can also uh, complete the project. That word afilu over here in the statement means afilu haninami dezutrenin, who means even these items that are very small and they only take a few minutes to do the whole project. Even those you cannot begin. I might have thought, the, once I begin, I'm already almost finished, right? The beginning is, it's, a, it's as if it's already, it's like a thing that I already started because the, the whole thing takes such a short time and therefore it teaches us, no, that you may not do them even though it's something that takes a short time. Okay, uh, so the first proof didn't work. Second proof also for the stringent opinion that we need both conditions as to be something that I started already and that I need to finish it for the holiday. Uh, so I can finish it if, if, it's, if I need it for the holiday. Okay, there he goes, pretty clear. Only if I started before and not if I'm starting on the 14th. Even if it's a small thing that takes a short time to do, only if it's for the holiday and if it's not for the holiday. Okay, this is, seems pretty clear that this is the stringent opinion. Um, however, it doesn't work. No, maybe really it would also be permitted even if I don't need it for the, uh, uh, for the, for the holiday, I can also finish it. And what this is teaching is that um, even if it's for the holiday, only if it finishes. In other words, this would be like, it, we can interpret these words like the second, like the third possibility that for the holiday or not for the holiday makes no difference. Only thing that makes difference is if um, I started before or not. That would fit into the words of this. So therefore there's no proof from here that um, like the first possibility. Okay, so proof number one, try, try to say it's like one, but we said, no, it can be interpreted like three. This proof, uh, we tried to say like one, but we end up saying it could be interpreted like two, but the final proof will work. Anything that you need for the holiday, you can finish on the 14th in the morning. If you don't need it for the holiday, prohibited. And a side halacha, separate halacha, and you're also you're allowed to do malacha on the Pesach in a place where, where the custom is. Only in the place where it's customary, but not otherwise. So it's very clear and explicit in this source that um, only if it's for the purpose of the holiday and it's something I began already before the 14th, then it's permitted, but not otherwise. Great. So we finally have that proof. And now we're going to go to Chachamim that talked about the three other craftsmen, and they can, uh, they can begin and end and do whatever they need to. Uh, according to Chachamim, they're more lenient. Chachamim, uh, shalosh umaniyot. Why these three? Well, we're going to compare them to Chol What we're going to show is that since these three people are allowed to do work on Chol all the more so they should be allowed to work on the 14th in the morning, uh, which is more lenient. Um, a non-professional, non you know, if you have a button you fell off during the holiday, you're allowed to sew with your home sewing kit. Uh, so that's fine. So since uh, sewing, 
by a non-professional is, per, per, is permitted, but sewing is permitted on Cholamoid in some fashion, therefore it's permitted on the 14th, even by a professional. Halacha, even nowadays, that we don't take haircuts or uh, do laundry during Cholam uh, because you should have done all that before. Don't spend time on Cholam when you should be celebrating um, and, uh, right, and make sure to get haircut before so you look for the, nice for the holiday. However, there are exceptions. Someone who was not able to get a haircut or wash his, wash his clothes beforehand because he was away or he was in jail. And now he got out and he came back on Cholam He's allowed to take a haircut and wash. Therefore, since it's someone is permitted to take a haircut and wash their clothes on Cholam therefore we say everyone is allowed to do so on the 14th. The Biose, but the Bioda Omer Afadatz Anin. So he says, he adds the shoemakers. Sheken Ole Regalim Metakenin Min Alehen Becholosh Moed. Because also on Cholom Moed, the people that would uh, come up to Jerusalem, they'd be law walking for a long time and the shoes would wear out. They had to go repair shoes and they were permitted to, because there's no way they could have done that before. Since it's permitted on Cholom Moed, it's also permitted on the 14th in the morning. Good. Now that only the Biyose said that's that's allowed, but not Chachamim. So what's the essence of their disagreement? So one sage says we can learn the starting something new from ending something. Um, in other words, according to uh, the Biyose, he says on the 14th in the morning, I can even begin to make a new shoe. And I learned that from Cholomoyed where I can repair a shoe. So even though on Cholomoyed I'm just com- com- uh, finishing a project by repairing, uh, that we can learn that on 14th I can even be- make a new shoe. However, Chachamim say no, uh, this would be the same as anything else. And just like on Cholomoyed you can only repair a shoe, so to the 14th on the morning, yes, you can repair a shoe, but you can start not start a new shoe. Good. And that is that Mishnah. And so now we get to the last Mishnah for today, which is more comparing Erev Pesach to Cholam Oed regarding these three activities. The Mishnah says, Moshivin Shavachin Natan Negolin Be'arba'a Asar. So you can uh, put eggs under a hen on the 14th. I mean, this is normally his work. You're taking care, you know, you're, you're uh, raising chickens, make, make, uh, 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 taking care of the eggs. And so if, uh, if, uh, if you need egg, an egg fertilized, a fertilized egg to be sat on, you can put it under the chicken. And if a chicken ran away, you can go get it and put it back on top of the eggs. You can oh, do, do that on the 14th in the morning. If the chicken died, then you can get another chicken to sit on the eggs and finish the process. That's topic number one. Uh, you can sweep the, the waste uh, from under the, the legs of an animal on the 14th. Uh, however, during Cholomoed, you can't sweep it out. You can just sweep it to the side. Uh, so you sweep it to the side of the barn, uh, whereas on the 14th, you can sweep it out and take it out to the, to the dumpster. Third topic, on the 14th of the morning, you can take vessels that need repairing uh, to the craftsmen, and you can take them if they're already repaired, you can go pick them up and bring them back, um, even if you don't need them for the moed, uh, because you don't want to leave them there the whole time, maybe they'll get stolen, maybe they'll get lost, and so you can uh, drop them off and pick them up. All right, let's discuss each one in turn. Why does the Mishnah say two cases that I can put the uh, the, uh, the the chicken on the egg, and if it runs away, I can return it? Well, if I can put it on in the first place, you know, a newly fertilized egg, if I can put it on the first place, then all the more so if it was on there and it ran away, I can put it back on, right? No, I need both of these clauses because we're talking about two different cases. The second one is talking about on Cholomoyed. So on Cholomoyed, which is more stringent, I can only return a chicken that was already sitting on its egg beforehand. On the 14th in the morning, I can even initially put a chicken on its egg to brood. 
Good, that's one uh, answer. Amarav Huna, lo shanu ela toch shelosh, that's the answer. Uh, now, Rav Huna is going to limit this halacha. Lo shanu ela toch shelosha limirda. Takati la parach simra mina. When it says you're going to um, go and, uh, and return it, you can only return the chicken onto the egg within three days of it running away. You see, a chicken goes through a process when it's ready to brood, um, it, uh, it, its body actually gets warmer and uh, is you know, totally, it, like, it prepares itself to be sitting on there. So it's in the mood to be there. That, and it will stay in that mood for three days. After three days, it already goes back to its normal, uh, um, normal status, and putting it on top of the eggs is not going to do anything for the chickens, right? It already got that instinct out of it. Okay, this is an amazing thing. I was just looking. Chickens, once they go into brooding mode, they stay there until they hear the bird, uh, the, the little uh, uh, birds chirp. And this is a problem for farmers nowadays because there might not be any chickens there. There's all kinds of ways to get the chicken out of it, out of the mood uh, because it can be very dangerous because it uses a lot of energy and won't go out and barely get food or anything during that time. Okay, so all this is uh, quite scientific um, uh, for those who have experience with this. So you can only return it within three days. After three days, there's no point in, in putting it back. Furthermore, it has to be that the chicken was on the egg already for at least three days, um, because once it's sitting on a fertilized egg for three days, then the egg already processes enough that it's not edible at all. And so if it's three days or more, and then it stops in the middle before it hatches, it's going to go, be, go, to, go, go to waste totally because it's not edible after three days. And if it's not sat on more, then it's not going to, it's not going to be born into a healthy chick. Uh, so that's the, two, um, that's the two requirements. And if you're missing any of these conditions, if either um, it left its, if le left its brooding for three days or more, for more than three days, or, right, so then it's heat, the heat of its body is, not, is, is gone, so it won't be able to sit on it. Or if it did not yet sit on the chicken, on the egg for three days, so then the chicken is still edible, somewhat edible. Um, so then you cannot return it because uh, you're not losing out. Uh, the whole, all this halakha is talking about uh, the, the cholamo'ed, the law on cholamo'ed is that you can do any melakha that will cause you loss, right? If you don't do it, it'll cause you financial loss. So if you don't put the chicken back on, you're going to lose these eggs. So that's why you're allowed to do them once they become un, uh, uh, inedible. He's more lenient and he says, even if the chicken sat on the eggs for one or two days and then ran away, you can still put it on. Even though these eggs are not so edible, like most people wouldn't eat them. Uh, but some people who aren't so picky, they would eat these eggs, even though they've been sat on for a couple of days. And already the inside is like, uh, you know, uh, we, we wouldn't eat that. Um, okay, what is the essence of their uh, of their dispute? This is actually important for halakha So Rav Huna, the first opinion says, um, we only say a person can do melacha on cholamoed if he's going to have incur a large loss. In other words, if he's going to lose out on the egg, the full value of the egg. But if it's only a partial loss, then he cannot do work. And so therefore, if the chicken sat on the egg for one or two days, and then its value is less, but not zero, because he could sell, it. some people would eat it, it's just not worth its full value as, a, as an eating egg. Um, so he says, you cannot return the chicken on it because you still, you're not losing so much. And the uh, said, says, even if it sat on the egg for one day, and now it's worth, it's good, it's going to be worth less than the amount of a, a totally um, a good egg. You're allowed to get the chicken and make it sit on it more so that it will finish the process and turn to a chick because otherwise you're going to lose out that small amount. Um, so therefore, even a small amount of loss, one is permitted to uh, work on Shabbat, uh, work on Chol in order to prevent it. Halakha is in fact like Rav Ameh, even a partial loss 
is still permitted. And that's very important today because many businesses today have salaries and overhead that they have to continue to pay and uh, they lose out on sales uh, because of the nature of the market if they close on Cholomoed. And so this is the reason why uh, many businesses today are allowed to open even on Cholomoed. And the last topic, God fin mitahat. So we about the sweeping under sweeping under the animals. We have a braita that has an internal contradiction. Tenora banan hazebel shabaha says mesalikin otoli sladi So we were talking about the barn before, but in the courtyard, um, uh, the waste in the courtyard, just sweep it to the side and don't take it out to the dumpster. If it's in the barn or the courtyard, you take it out to the dumpster. You're right. So you see the contradiction. The first half says you sweep it to the side of the courtyard. And then we say also the courtyard, you put it in the dumpster. So which one is it? Two answers. First, you said that if it's in the courtyard, you put it on the side. And then you said if it's in the barn or the courtyard, you put it in the dumpster. So, which one is it? Answer number one. It's so similar to what we answered before. We're talking about two different cases. On the 14th, of Pesach, then you can take it out to the dumpster because that's more lenient. On Cholomoed, it's more stringent. You have to push it to the side. That's, so that's, uh, that resolves the contradiction. No, you can even explain that both are talking about Cholomoed. Right, the comparison of the Chased and the Refet. So if if it's in the, just in the courtyard, so you push it off to the side. If the courtyard becomes full, so full of waste that it's as dirty as a barn, then you can take it out totally to the to the dumpster. So he resolves it on uh, depending on just how dirty it actually got. Okay, and the last topic: uh, So bringing things to the craftsmen, uh, vessels that need repairing. So the papa talks about his teacher Rava. He says one time Rava gave him gave him a test. This is the final, right? That they had to pass. So let's see if you can pass the final. Tenan. Uh, Molly is going to bring two contradictory Mishnayot, and the students have to figure out how to resolve them. This is our Mishnah here in Pesachim that says you can take and bring back vessels to the craftsmen and from the craftsmen, even though you don't need them on the holiday, you're still allowed. Would mean who? However, in Masechet Moed Katan, we have another Mishnah that says, and maybe in Kelim Bet you may not bring the vessel, you know, may not uh, bring the vessels to, uh, so from, you can't bring them back from the craftsman's house. However, if you're afraid that they're going to be stolen while they're sitting there in a craftsman's house, then you can go and take them from the Christmas house and put them into another nearby house. Don't bring them all the way home. In other words, just do the minimal amount so that it won't get stolen. But you can't bring them all the way home. And if you, you can only, and even that, you can only, it's about taking them. If you can barely take them home, you certainly cannot bring them to the craftsman. So this Mishnah is much more stringent than our Mishnah. Okay, how are you going to solve this problem? Mishaninan, and the student said, oh, this is the answer we wrote. La kashya kan barbasar kan bechuloshon moed. All right, we're used to this answer already, right? The uh, our Mishnah that is lenient is talking about the fourteenth in the in the morning, uh, and uh, the one that says it's prohibited is on cholamoyed, which is more stringent. Good, that's one answer. Or ibayet ema have a bechuloshon moed la kashya kan be maamino kan be sheno maamino. It depends if you trust the craftsman that he's going to take good care of these uh, of these items during the holiday, uh, then that's fine. Then you leave them there. That's the second one. But if you don't trust him and, you know, you know, afraid he's going to it's going to be stolen or he'll sell to someone else or a problem, then you can take them home. And we're going to prove this uh, second answer from a Baraita, the Hatanya, right? Indeed, sometimes Hatanya is a question, but here it's a proof. Maybe in Kelim mi ben ha'uman, you are allowed to bring back, take 
uh, your vessels from the craftsman house. For example, a jug from the potter or a glass house from the glassmaker. Here's some examples of glass from the times of the Talmud. That's okay because you can need those on the holiday. But you cannot bring wool from the house of the dyer. You don't need wool on the holiday. It's not a clo- it's not a piece of clothing. You can't wear uh, just you know strings, um, and uh, not uh, and not cra- and not uh, other vessels that you wouldn't need for the holiday from the craftsman's house. If the craftsman has nothing to eat, then you are allowed to. Give, it, give him the vessel and give him money. This is a, just as simply as an act of charity so that he'll have food to eat. And so in that case, you know, you're, you're not doing it because you want him to do work or, or because you, it's, you know, you're allowed to do work in giving it to him only because it's an excuse to give him money to live on. So that's okay also. This comes up as a halakha, you know, if pe- someone is poor, uh, they're allowed to do certain things on cholamoed. Okay. If you don't trust the your, your vessels that they remain at his house all the whole holiday, then you go and put them in a nearby house where they'll where they will where they will be protected. If you're afraid that they'll be stolen and even that is no good, then you bring them quietly while no one's looking into your house. Uh, the point is that you don't want to violate uh, publicly the, the holiday, the sanctity of it by, by making deliveries and bringing and coming and going. And so, but you still have to, it's okay because you don't want to lead to a loss. Right, you're allowed to do something that is going to lead to a loss. So if you're afraid that you're going to lose it um, there, bring it to a nearby house. Otherwise, bring it home, but do it quietly. Good. So all that are two answers. However, you gave an answer only for taking something from the Craftsman house and bringing back to your house. But you didn't explain the contradiction between the two Mishnayot about bring, giving, it to the, giving it to him in the first place. Uh, because uh, the second Mishnah says you cannot bring them home, and all the more so you can't give it to him. And you didn't. Ex- the second answer didn't explain that. Rather, we're going to reject the second answer, and we're going to go back to the first answer that the lenient Mishnah is talking about the 14th in the, in the morning, and the stringent Mishnah is talking about. Hol ha-mo-ed. Baruch Adonai lo-lam. Amen ve-amen.